name's Glyn Pooley and I'd like to talk about art. This time my subject is... Catherine Williams. A little bit about his life. He was born in 1918, Langenvi in Anglesey, to um, an old family, old landed family. I think his dad was a bank manager and his mum, somebody who was passionate against the Welsh and the Welsh language, tongue in cheek, but he fought obviously against that in terms of uh, particularly his later work when he started promoting Wales. And he went to Morton Hall School and Shrewsbury School, which unfortunately at the time he contracted polio, which led to his epilepsy. Now, he describes his epilepsy as uh, described as his greatest fortune because, you know, there were side effects to that. And one of, one of the side effects, it got him out of his army career, although he kind of signed up for the, the Welsh Fusiliers as a lieutenant. His doctor said to him, you know, because of the epilepsy, you, maybe you should take up art. So it changed up his whole path in life. And then he went on to study at the Slade School. Initially told he couldn't draw, which when you see his drawings is a bit odd. But then he won the portrait prize in the last last year. So, you know, he had a grounding, a deep grounding in the uh, technical forms of art from the Slade, which was heavily grounded in, in drawing and painting techniques. But he developed his own language. So this bold, strong, definitive line and quality you see, uh, which was in his character comes out in his artwork you can see that the welsh artists generally are so imbued and so embraced in their land they cr they, they seem to work in similar ways often we, we, we see this kind of strong dark mark and line being repeating itself over and over but for us looking about creating the essence of in and maybe an essence of what you need to make an artwork you can see how the artist goes about it here the drawing's in the ink, you know, and there's ink and wash, but he's thinking in terms of tones, uh, light and dark areas, because that is the information he needs when he starts to make his painting. In this hilltop farm, again, you can see that, just a wash of the, of the ink, strong ink drawing, but there's definitions between the light and dark areas. And it's these tonal areas which are important if you want to translate that into paint, particularly for the way guffing, guffing works because there it's uh, with the palette knife. It's always interesting to have a look at the paint and make in a self-portrait of himself because it gives you an insight into his character, the way he kind of perceives himself. He was seen as having someone with a couple of sides to their personality, obviously the ebullient and the person who could kind of hold a, a conversation with anyone from the royal family right the way through to ordinary folk around his community. He also taught in Highgate School in London, so there's connections with the youngsters there as well, and we see that in a couple of paintings that he made. He's kind of looking just to the left here, just outside, he's questioning something is going on in his gaze there. He's not showing the whole of himself. There's two sides to himself. The other side of his character, which was the, the dark side, which maybe gave him the insight, which was you know, around the epilepsy, but also he did suffer from uh, depression and other elements. So sometimes it goes hand in hand with the sensitivity of, of the artist, but he kind of balanced it out and you see all those qualities coming out in his paintings. Even in his self-portrait, you can see the main structure and characteristics of his work starting to be shown. You know, this is a you know an early one, early painting by him, of uh, obviously a serviceman. So he said he he was due to go into the into the army. So he had a a real potentially empathy for people in these kinds of positions. So though he was going in as a kind of kind of high rank, he could still connect with the ordinary fella in there, do the mainstream fighting. I think that also comes from his background as well. He was from. Well, it was a landed family, but there was lots of generations of ministers in his family as well. So he was interested in people. He was interested in the full rounded quality of what made people tick. This is what Cuffin has seemed to do. Sometimes his, his portraits are some of his best artworks. He's known for his landscapes. There's something about his ability to get the insight into the character. There's something about you can go in and discover 
about the interior world of the sitter. And that's always really important. When they are, you know, asked him, was that a large part of his motivation to do it? He said he found his self-portraits really kind of difficult to make and he was always after a likeness. And of course, you know, the likeness is pretty important, but it's not by any means the, the sole objective. The portrait it's obviously been seen and developed during the 20th century, but he manages to get a balance. So using figuration, he gets this balance between the structure and the compositional structure of the of the artwork, his own language, which of course is the uh, the slabs of paint. But you can see in this early one, done you know just after the slade, he's using the brush here as well. So he's using the brush to define the areas and build up areas, and that develops into the into his later style, where the where the knife starts to become more more evident. But you can see he, as well as that, he's managed to get the insight into the, into the figure and the character's head and mind, if you like. Nice to see how an artist approaches the subject in terms of how they gather information. So in this picture of Evan Roberts, who was uh, was a farmer, but he was he was a blind in his older life. He was blind and a botanist as well. But there was a real from reading about Cuffin's interaction with uh, some of these sitters. He talks about there was a real sincerity and serenity in in this sitter. He gathers the information, you know, line is important there, and then how he translates that into the uh, painting. We start to see also this kind of certain characteristics of the structure of his paintings. They kind of background colour and the absence of information in his portraits in the background is kind of important. He uses it almost like as a, you know, a symbolic way means to say something about the sitter so symbolic use of this warm gray you know gives, it gives you a kind of feeling about and the coolness of the color enables us to kind of uh, relate to um, the sitters if you like serenity and stillness but the way he places the sitter in the canvas is important as well often you see them looking up to the left their size of their head in relation to the space around the canvas tells you something about their characters, whether they be big and bold or the, whether they be sensitive and quiet souls. This one is an interesting one, I think, of a German girl. You do, in this one, get an insight into her, her character. This was probably painted in London. And you can think, you know, 1963, not so long after the Second World War, and she becomes kind of outsider with an insight and often that's how um, Cuffin would kind of see himself. He had a connection with those kinds of characters. Maybe on the outside, you know, there was a shell where they kind of promote themselves within the environment they found themselves. But then there's the sensitive, vulnerable side, which is coming through as well. And you, you know, again, you can see, we talked about the positioning of the head within the picture plane. If it's, if it's big, they're bold. If it's, if it's small, then there's a sensitivity and vulnerability can be kind of portrayed, um, a lot more space around. Also, it's a limited palette as well. He often paints with a, a limited palette, which he feels sums up that sitter the most succinctly. And we also see this kind of suggested shadow uh, behind the sitter often as well altered state and altered ego if you like or just some way of presenting the, the sitter away from their environment the other side of their personality is there in the shadows see again here with a little girl guide in the, in the scouts painted quite a few children over the years a number of them were commissions you know wealthy patrons or whatever would ask for their their children to be painted or sometimes you know important characters of Welsh life particularly later on for, for Cuffin. Again he has the insight into them it's when you look, look at the eyes and they become still but in this one you know the slate like quality of all this background in some respects is a little bit overpowering for the little girl who was a guy but that kind of again tells another interesting interesting story See the shadow, see the space around, see the amount of space around, and that gives us the psychological impact of the sitter.
as is with this one, Hugh Thomas, Portrait of a Farmer. The deep link with the land, the farm, you know, he's brought up on Anglesey, is inevitable, and that connection is there. Hugh Thomas, in this portrait, had just lost his wife. And, uh, the local minister asked uh, Kathleen to make this portrait at this time because he was going through, you know, a wonderful state time. So, kind of dis to try and distract him, Kathleen Williams, because I said could be quite an entertainer. But he's managed in this picture to get that sense of loss or sadness or grief, which is coming through in Hugh Thomas's. Uh, face there and when you think you know this is done with quite bold solid marks there's a, a real interesting kind of quality to it again we see the sitter just looking off to the left out beyond into another world the sense of symbolic use of colors muted colors the cool colors which ref which give an indication of reflection and the kind of uh, distance as well and they're all being used in a very strong structural way to hold the picture together really uh, interesting and as in this one as well you sense this vulnerability in this sitter jack jones was a, an artist from swansea who cuffing would have met up in london who's part of the london well set who was a kind of real a bullion character jack jones was himself I had a kind of <laughs> another kind of bit of a tragic life, you know, he lost his uh, uh, wife and daughter. And you kind of see this being shown in this in this portrait. So there's there's a sensitivity again and an understanding. Um the artist of course is looking down. In this case the sitter's looking down and away, and you kind of engage with that kind of quality. And there's also turbulence in the sitter's uh, demeanour, hence the way He's uh, portrayed the background. There's a lot of energy there being used, but he's given it the monumental structure by this bold slab of tone in the foreground to hold the whole thing together. So you can see how the paint is being used here for, if you like, psychological portrayal, uh, whether it be still and solid or a combination of that with movement and agitation in the paint all to reflect elements of the sitter's personality and lifestyles and things like that so there's a sensitivity being shown and you see a sense this is another sensitive uh, portrayal of a academic there's this the kind of nervousness kind of creeps through in this picture which is i find quite quite fascinating that nervousness of the sitter seems to be this it just sits there, you know, and emanates. Interested in that the yellow tie draws the, the colour and the intention right to the centre of all these kind of greys. The look and that kind of apprehension on the sitter just stays with you. Obviously, there's an element of defensiveness there. And maybe this is, you know, one of the many middle class people at the time that were not just uh, buying Cuffin's work, but they were kind of heavily in evidence of part of the art scene and the art art world it became very fashionable i suppose at the end of the 20th century to buy a cuff in williams and most middle class families were encouraged to get one <laughs> there was lots out there and cuffing did uh, have a prodigious output even when he was teaching i think he made 100 pictures uh, a year uh, but he retired early i think about 54 55 years old and then dedicated himself to making more and more artworks and producing uh, uh, Welsh and uh, promoting Welsh art so much so that they made a gallery uh, museum for him I haven't been up to see it I think some of you have on Anglesey itself which is supposed to be really impressive to see so you know he, he became a real kind of uh, focus of the, of, of the Welsh art by by that time early 21st century this is again interesting to see for us how he gathers the information strong bold pencil lines strong marks there with the um the watercolor washes petted outside in the elements so you can see the vigorous energy of the marks being put down but very strong and bold lines are holding the picture together he was quite famous for the land pictures of wales and the, and the mountains of course artists have been drawn to north wales for those reasons for many centuries 
and these pictures with uh, farmers and their dogs um, up in the mountains, uh, something which he repeats over and over. Gives an insight into the, the rugged landscape, but also the rugged nature of the occupations of these uh, farmers and their lifestyles. Often it's a farmer with a dog or a group of farmers with a dog. Got a lovely portrayal there of the character of the dog out in the field looking uh, very, very attentive at the job he's going to do. So it's often the farmers with a dog telling the story of what it was like to live this rural lifestyle. You can see here again there's a there's an aloneness being portrayed, should we say? That's a C.S. Lewis term, if anyone's read those. There's also famous characters by R.S. Thomas as well, a famous uh, uh, writer, poet, who talks about this kind of ruggedness of the character within the landscape. And he, the Cuffin did make a portrait of R.S. Thomas. It's interesting if you look at it. Yeah. It's kind of quirky. I didn't put it in this presentation because it's quite a quirky, but obviously take a moment to look at it. It's probably on the on the internet. It's something about uh, how he connects the the figure, the lone figure in the landscape, with the, the ruggedness of the land. You know, he talks about the farmers. He talks about uh, the the mud and, and and the hardness of the land and the landscape. And these are things which kind of cross over with Cuffin's work. You know, the slate greys. Of, and the cool grey colours of the often beautiful Welsh weather that we have in North Wales all the time, maybe not, you know, it's, it's being shown and the rugged landscape there. And the way through that kind of rugged landscape sometimes of this period is to have the just a dog of determination to carry on with your best friend, <laughs> which is often in these terms with, with the dog, you know. So you see these over and over, these kinds of traits and these kind of patterns. Again, figures, farmers, dogs in a rugged, harsh landscape. Snow, simple sky again, but it's blue-gray, you know, snow coming down in action. Looking after and protecting their sheep, in this case, hill farmers. As they are here, chasing away the fox. He would go, Cuffin would go up with his farm farmers up in the mountains. He's quite a rugged character himself and do these uh, kind of drawings to portray this. But you can see how all this, these kind of images would uh, find themselves interesting to the London Welsh set as well. They said he said he would make these sketches, do these drawings before he retired and he would go back up to London where he was teaching and then make these paintings. And you can imagine how in the centre of the city during that time you know the image of wales was kind of particularly north wales centered around the land you know the beautiful landscape things get romanticized on it when you're out of it particularly if you're living in a city romanticized hills and mountains and the rural lifestyle it catches the imagination should we say there but it's of course the loneliness of the, the farmer with his with his dog from up there put this in because it's interesting he was in, he won a scholarship in 1968 to go to Patagonia, the place where the Welsh set up their own colony. He made about 50 paintings over there, and you can see that what starts what the reason I put it in is because it does influence his his work in some respects. The colour changes. You can see in this one the landscapes of the the, the earth landscapes are very different. The reds, the browns, the warms are there, but also this with the skies, Patagonian sunset, particularly some of uh, his later landscapes in Wales, where he incorporates the sea and the coast, he starts to be particularly interested in the light and lighting effects. But uh, they, they first appear in these Patagonian pictures, lovely purples and reds in that picture. You know, you start to see it, see how it comes out, that glow, that Patagonian glow starts to come out in his Welsh pictures later on in the 80s. Tal Cern, place near Aberystwyth, which is an ancient medieval convent and uh, medieval spiritual links to the land. They're, they're dotted all over Wales. But there's a radiance of colour there, which is a softness, which is being shown. It's uplifting. Again, a sunset, an Anglesey, kind of late picture now. Interesting, really, mixture of the two kind of uh, elements of the Patagonian interest in those 
warm hues, but then the slate greys or the darkness of the heavier North Walian pictures. Some of you might have also seen, there's a third area, I suppose, of Catherine Williams' work, which is when he went over to Venice, uh, I think it was in the 90s or something like that, and made a series of pictures over there. They're good, but they're not as deeply connected or heartfelt, I would say, as uh, his, his Welsh pictures, his kind of portraits. He was a bit like a man out of place over there, should we say, which the Welsh often are when you pull them out of their country. Strange, isn't it? Here, as I said, in this later picture, you've got the combination of those two, two influences. So there we go. That's Catherine Williams' work. If you like this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the bell notification.